but pretty much all of our other vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. You are. Okay. Doing really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we go. Permanently tired. <laughs> Nobody's arguing with him. Permanently tired. Didn't say permanently retired. It just said permanently tired. <laughs> That? Yeah. That's what I want to be wearing. <laughs> I'm tired. Permanently. <laughs> uh, all right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for your love and your blessings. And Lord, we just thank you for salvation with the cross of Calvary, Lord, and our precious Savior shed his blood, Lord, that we might have eternal life. And Lord, the life that we even have here in this, this time, Lord, that you're watching over us and taking care of us in ways that we could not do. We thank you, Lord. Now, bless us as we look into your word and guide us and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. All right. Revelation chapter 2. Mm. Revelation chapter 2. We'll start in verse 12. <coughs> Revelation 2. Mm. Verse 12. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Ant Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. Realize what he's saying there. Each one of us is very special in the eyes of our Savior. Each one of us, of all of the multitudes, and yet he takes note of each one of us. And he's preparing, uh, I believe, he's preparing a mansion in eternity that is suited to each of us, to our likes, to our wants. You know, he knows all about us, and he wants to do that for us. A white stone, because each one is unique. Oh, that's not what we're really looking at right now, I guess. But uh, now then, with that reading, uh, I want to go to Revelation chapter 17. You see, I thought we were going to study the Church of Pergamos. We are, but we're going to do introductory work, too. All right? <clears throat> Revelation chapter 17. When we get there, 10 years from now, it may be, I do not know, but we'll get there. If I don't get there, someone will take over from me, and they'll get there. <laughs> All right. Chapter 17 of Revelation, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast, 
full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead, and here's where we want to get to um, when we come back to Revelation 17 and later on, we'll get into a lot of this. But I want to look at verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the murders of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, and that he should not have done, as the angel said to him in verse 7, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which has seven heads and ten horns. And, and again, we'll come back to many of the, much of the details of, uh, that are there in chapter 17. But this is introductory work to Pergamus. You say, I don't, I, I don't, I didn't see Pergamus there. No, you didn't, but you will la later on, okay? <laughs> you have to follow me. The Babylon of Revelation is characterized by the name of mystery. That's an important word, mystery. And this mystery takes us to the Babylonian system. This Babylonian system, known as the Chaldean Mysteries. The Babylonian Mysteries. What was the design of these ancient mysteries? We're going to talk about it and identify this Babylon, Babylonian Mysteries. Because we're seeing these mysteries in Revelation chapter 17. We see them now. I'll, I'll hope they'll get to that tonight too in this present hour the mysteries are there now <clears throat> uh, let me move some paper and we'll get to that the design of the mysteries the Babylonian mysteries and what we just read there in Revelation 17 Alexander Hazel, you've heard me mention that name. I highly recommend that book. It's, it's detailed, but nevertheless, it's worth owning and worth reading. I've read it for many years. I read it over and over and over. And um, it was first published in 1853 as a pamphlet was expanded again in 1858. That's how long it's been around. And no one has disproved the writings of Alexander Hislop to this date. No one, no party has refuted it. It stands still. Now, it's not scripture, of course not, but it is full of great truth. And we're going to look at some of this. The mystery uh, we think of Paul's mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2 7. If you, well, maybe we'll all go out and read it. Let's, let's take time. 2 Thessalonians. <clears throat> yeah. I think that comes right after 1 Thessalonians. That's, a, that, that's what I was taught. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2 7. Uh, well, am, am, I, am I still in the right place? I thought I was. Was that 2 Thessalonians 2 7? I thought that's what it was. Hmm. Yes. Why am I not seeing this right? Oh, here we go. I was looking at the wrong chapter. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth or restrains will restrain or let until he be taken out of the way. How important, by the way, is the local New Testament church? Absolutely. 
Do you realize once the rapture occurs and the New Testament church is taken out, the saints are taken out, Antichrist takes over. Right. He could be living right now. Mm -hmm. Very well could be living right now. Yeah. He cannot be revealed. He cannot be turned loose until we are gone. You wonder, even a, again, Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. Jesus is there mm -hmm. in the midst. And he's here in the midst. And as long as he is in our midst, and as long as we are here, Antichrist can't do a thing. Right. All right? So, uh, the Paul's mystery of iniquity, as described in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, as we have read, has its counterpart in the Church of Rome. And this we're going to look at for a little while. The mystery of iniquity is publicly illustrated even today. <laughs> Did I bring it? Did I bring it? Liz hmm? went to all that trouble. I got to look and see. I thought I brought it. Well, I'll tell you about it. Uh, I didn't. Did I? But I did point to this what well, just recently. We all are familiar with what's going on in America and around the world. And around the world. Um, the LGBTQ T plus or the LGBTQ plus. We are familiar with that, the gay movement, the homosexual crowd, the lesbian crowd, the queer crowd, whatever word you want to use. And it's, it is designed by Satan to destroy Christian America. Mm -hmm. It is designed by Satan to destroy Christians around the world. But as long as the local church is here and Christ is in the midst, it will not happen yet. However, it is doing much damage. I had I have a copy. I think I brought that to you. And I oh here it is. I do have it. Here it is. Vatican document. And I think I told you before, and I'll say it again. The Lord allowed me to go to Italy back in the early, probably about 1953. I'm thinking. I didn't write down the date, but that's long. How many was alive in 53? Only Bill and Jack. Jack, are you that old? Oh my goodness. All right, yeah, he is. <laughs> 1953. Went to Rome. I went to the Vatican. I went through the Vatican. And I saw the seeds, if you want to look at that that way, of what is happening today. I saw idolatry. Yes, I did see firsthand with my own eyes. In those days, my eyes were better than they are now. I saw idolatry. Mm -hmm. You know what idolatry is? Worshiping things you ought not to be. I remember as I was walking through the Vatican and come to this statue of a black panther, I think it was. And, and I noticed something. Did I tell you this before? I'll say it again. I noticed something. I stood and looked at it. And I saw it immediately. There's one paw of that animal that was worn away. Now, made of marble. How many centuries do you think it must have taken to wear that marble paw away? You know why it was that way? Because they were taught, the, those who went into the Vatican, they were taught that if you will rub your hand against the paw of that animal, it will bring you good fortune. The Lord will really pour blessings upon you, whatever, whatever, whatever. 
people believed that. And that Paul was almost, it was not completely gone, but it was worn down, and I stood and looked at that. Idolatry. Church of Rome is idolatrous. Now, I will have to say this. We have those who have come out of the Church of Rome, the Protestants, and in those groups, you're going to find idolatry. Mm-hmm. And they admit it. Some, now, nowadays, they don't admit it so much. But now, there's something else. The Vatican document, this is from Wednesday, June the 21st, 2023. That's this year. Okay? The Oklahoman, coming from Oklahoma City. I have it in my hands, and I'll read just a little bit right to start with. Vatican City, an unprecedented global canvassing of Catholics has called for the church to take concrete steps to promote women in decision-making roles. Paul Kala, now listen to this. For a radical inclusion of the LGBTQ plus community and for new accountability measures to check how bishops exercise authority. This LGBTQ, if, if you're not familiar with that, I don't know where you've been. It's been in the news, has it not? Oh, yeah. In the newspapers. One TV, has it not? Mm-hmm. Who has never heard of it? I think we've all heard, all adults. Now the kids know nothing about it. But that is designed by Satan to destroy Christianity. I've got a book called The Dark Agenda. It was not written by a Christian, but it was written by a Jew, but he was showing, a very good man, written to show that what we're just talking about, the LGBTQ, this gay movement, was designed to destroy Christianity. And he goes into great detail. I think the book is called The Dark Agenda. Anyway, I'll, I can't give you any, John might never know the name of the author right offhand, but I don't, uh, I can give it to you if you want it. Dark Agenda? I, dark Agenda. I believe that's, that sounds like that's Glenn Beck's book. No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a Jewish commentator. Anyway, we'll give it to you later. All right, now, um, anyway, oh my. I got to underline one more paragraph I want to read to you. Perhaps I'm reading from this. Again, this is from Rome. This is from the Daily Oklahoman. The Oklahoman. I take it. Someone else pays for it, but I take it. All right. <laughs> Quote Perhaps most significantly, the document that we're talking about used the terminology LGBTQ plus persons rather than the Vatican traditional persons with homosexual tendencies. No mind. Suggesting a level of acceptance that Francis, that is Pope Francis, ushered in a decade ago with his famous Who Am I to Judge? He's, he is embracing these people. He's including these people in the traditions of Rome. It's there in black and white. Mm-hmm. Now, let's move on. So, we're looking at idolatry, and as I said, <laughs> I saw it in the Vatican, and licentiousness, lust, moral, moral, oh my. And by the way, this licentiousness, while I was living in Pueblo, Colorado, I had next door neighbors, and I won't mention their names, they passed on actually. One of them I was able to lead to the Lord. Um, Anyway, um, 
They were Roman Catholics. And they told me, or I was told by the one that I led to the Lord, <laughs> I didn't talk to I let me talk to you a little bit about him. Um, I uh, they, he didn't talk to me. Well, it, it, his wife, who was a staunch Roman Catholic, he would admit it. What was going on in the Roman Catholic Church between the nuns and the priest? You adults getting me? Licentiousness. And they tried to justify, or she did, but I would not accept the justification. This is, this is going on for centuries. Idolatry and licentiousness. Where does it all come from? See. Babylon. Mm -hmm. Rome today is Babylonianism. Mm -hmm. It will continue to gain strength and it's going to be prominent in the days to come. When we just read about it, did we not? In Revelation chapter 17. It's here. Now, uh, let me go on. Rome. Uh, we're talking about deviation of rectitude. What does that mean? Rightness of principle and practice. Baptist and church history. I, oh, some of these days, if the if Lord grants me to live long enough, I want to do Baptist history. And you're going to learn so much. Now, it will take, I will, it, it can't be done in a week or two, I warn you. I trace Baptist history all the way from the founding of the Baptist church in the time of Christ all the way to America, coming up through um, Europe, Africa, yes, North Africa, uh, Europe, England, to America. I trace all that history, and I'll show you where we're at in America today. Well. John wanted to say something. David Horowitz. David Horowitz is the author of The Dark Agenda. I recommend it. It's not a big book, but I recommend it. Try to find it online. You might get it pretty cheap. But you read it, and you're going to discover what I'm talking about. The LGBT uh, plus, as wrong they call it, uh, is, is designed by Satan to destroy the church the New Testament church. Now, Horowitz himself is Jew, but he he's very sympathetic to, well, he's going to defend, he's, he's going to speak for the Christians because it can also come to him too. He knows what's coming. All right? Now, um, Pope Innocent III. <laughs> you ever heard of Pope Innocent III? He wasn't very innocent. No, he was not very innocent. Crusades against Christians, and, and especially uh, against Baptist history, murdering, killing, maiming, in the name of the Roman Catholic Church. And that will all come, I can go into detail with all of that, I've got that. If someone doesn't burn up my notes before I get to them. All right? Now let's come back. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we're going all the way back to Babylonianism. We're going back to Genesis 10, 11. We're not going to turn back there into Scripture. You've heard of Nimrod. Nimrod had a wife. Her name was Semiramis. Are you ready for this? We're going to talk about her. She is the one who is one who has brought about all of this idolatry, all of this licentiousness, unto the present hour. The wife, you know, there's recorded history, it's there, it's documented. Um, oh my. Samaritan was worshipped as the great mother of the gods. She was the great mother of the gods. Now I notice some, well, what does that mean? I don't see anything uh, special about that. Well, I don't think we have uh, what we had in Pueblo. 
there was a church, it's called the Church of God, but don't equate it with the, the Church of God here in Sand Springs. It's a different group. The Church of God people, they knocked on my door in Pueblo, Colorado, a man and a woman. And they began to, they said, we want to talk to you about the Mother God. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> well, do you know, and I know something, and I'm asking you a question. I was looking at them in the eye. says, are you familiar with Babylonianism? They looked at one another. No. You're not familiar with Babylonianism? You've never heard of Salamis, the wife of Nimrod? Who through the ages, was down through the years, has all the way come through the Catholic Church? Idolatry, licentiousness. By that time, they turned around and walked away in disgust. They, they didn't want to hear any more from them. I didn't wish them well. But they're out there. They're out there. And they're, even in other groups, they're out there. All right, now let's move on. Uh, Samiramis was worshipped as the great mother of the gods. Oh my. <laughs> Now, while overlaid with idolatry, and they're, oh, they're just full of idolatry, I told you about a little bit of what I saw with my own eyes. Now, the recognition of the Trinity. I'm, we're going to spend a little time here. Early on, very early on in, in the early days of humanity, going all the way back to Genesis 1, 2, 3, and right on through the early chapters of Genesis, well, John will cover some of these days. He'll take you back and pinpoint it all. Well, yes, he will. I've got material in my library that'll help him. Okay, um, and my library, by the way, goes to him. Um, now, there are others I know would like to have. In fact, I had one man, a bless his heart, he said, "I want a book from your library." I gave him one. Anyway. Um, if I find an expert, I'm going to give one to this pastor. If I, if I come up with another one that I don't need, I'm going to give him. It may not be anything you want, but you'll have one, at least remember. Yeah. <laughs> All right, anyway, we'll get you. Uh, recognition of the Trinity. Yes. Recognition of the Trinity, even there in Babylonianism. Recognition of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Right. Yes, it was there. Why am I saying all of that? Oh, boy, I'll get to that. The Trinity was universal. It was worldwide in all the ancient nations of the world, proving how deep-rooted in the human race was the primeval, that is, first civilization's doctrine on the subject. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But something's going to change. Something is going to change because of Babylonianism, because of Roman Catholic Church today. So then came Babylonianism. The three persons came to be, now listen to this, thanks to Samirinus, uh, the wife of Nimrod, the three persons came to be, number one, the eternal Father, number two, the Spirit of God incarnate in a mother. That was the second person of the Trinity. The mother God, the second person of the Trinity. Babylonianism, Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism today. I'm going to prove it from their own writings. Are you ready for it? Ugh. It's already half an hour gone. Hmm. All right, here we go. The mother became the favorite object of worship. What about what about the first person of the Godhead? He was practically overlooked. The father went into silence. Everything was focused on the mother, the second person of the evil trinity. God the mother. 
that people want to talk. That, and again, you know, this couple that knocked on my door. We want to talk to you about the mother of God. I think there's quickly they understood I didn't want to hear about the mother of God. And they walked, well, they, I could tell they were upset. I said, maybe you better go and learn a little bit about Babylonianism. I doubt if they did. Well, anyway. Well, let's move on, all right? And uh, we're looking at Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. Uh, following quotations are from the book written by uh, Catholic Cardinal Alfonso de Liberi. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. I haven't. I know I do have the, uh, the, the writings and so forth and so on. Now, number one. We talk about Samaritans, but today we're talking about Mary, are we not? Yeah. When you go to Rome, you're talking about Mary. I walk around the neighborhood and I see these little emblems on the back of some cars, and I know what it is. I recognize what it is. It's, it's the Catholic Mary. I don't have you noticed it or not. I'll see a little picture of, a, of the lady and the circle of overhead. Of folk. <laughs> anyway. I recognize what it is. I know what it is. It's the worship of Mary. It comes from the worship of Samiramis, wife of Nimrod, Babylonianism. Now, let's, let's just do something here. Again, from Cardinal Alfonso de Liguri's book. He's, by the way, he's highly recommended and so forth of, of the Catholics. Number one, Mary is given the place belonging to Christ. And that's exactly what happened in the days of Babylon. So Miramis. Read it again. Mary is given the place belonging to Christ. And that's happening today. Absolutely. Quote, And she is truly a mediatress of peace between sinners and God. Now listen to this. Sinners receive pardon by Mary alone. This is from Cardinal D. Uh, Alfonso D. Liguri's book. Mm -hmm. All right? Do we believe that? I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. We know who we believe in Jesus Christ. He alone is able to save us, He alone can save us. Anyway, well, I'll finish this short one. Um, Sinners receive pardon by Mary alone. He fails and is lost who has not recourse to Mary. So if, you, if you're not worshiping Mary of the Catholic Church today, you're not going to go to heaven. That's what they're saying. Number two, Mary is the gate to heaven instead of Christ. Yeah, that's what it says. Mary is the gate to heaven instead of Christ. Mary is called the gate of heaven. No one can enter that blessed kingdom without passing through her. That's Rome today, people. That's Rome. You know, what's happening in the world today? And I think I mentioned this maybe the last time I spoke here. Uh, I wonder how many Catholics really know what's happening in Rome. I've been there. And I've kept up with Rome through the decades that I'm still alive. It's a wonder they haven't shot me, but that may come too. Now, but I do wonder how many know what's really happening and how many knows how Pope Francis, who I call an antichrist, mm -hmm. by the way, our Baptist forebears, were, they, they were very quick to call the Pope of their days antichrist. Mm -hmm. Antichrist. Now, the way of salvation, they go on, she goes on to say, is open to none otherwise than through Mary. And since our salvation is in the hands of Mary, he who is protected by Mary will be saved. He who is not will be lost. This is their teaching. 
How many know that? Pope Francis today is a believer in what we were just talking about from that article from the newspaper, the LGBT. He is. He promotes it. He's accepted it. He wants it to be intertwined with the doctrines of Rome. Pope Francis is also anti-capitalist. He favors Russian communism over American capitalism. I wonder how many Catholics know that today. I've got a newspaper at home article confirming that. I've got it. Well, right on. <laughs> Mary, number three, Mary is glorified more than Christ. Quote, the Holy Church, that is the Catholic Church, commands a worship peculiar to Mary. Many things are asked from God. Listen to this. Many things are asked from God and are not granted. They are asked from Mary and are obtained. Why? This is what they say. For she is even, this is the words of Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. Are you ready? Mary, she is even queen of hell and sovereign mistress of the devils. Did you get that? How many wonder, I wonder how many Catholics know that. They're probably like a lot of other Protestants and even Baptists, I'm sorry to say, that don't read. And they don't even go to church like they should to listen to things like that. You know, our, our Baptist forebears, oh my, they would go to, they were regular in church. They were regular. They, every chance they could get, they were in church. It may have been in uh, the catacombs, it may have been in the mountains, who knows where it might, in the caves. They had to meet, and they did. And it may in small little groups like we are here today. They're not so high pollutant that they'll come here. Now, well, hold on. So Mary is glorified more than Christ. Oh, I gotta move on. Mary, number four. Mary is given the power of Christ. Are you ready for this one? See, no, 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 I'll say that again. Mary is given more power than Christ. Christ, we know, is the second person of the Trinity. He is God. Jesus is God. He has all power. We know that. He's the creator of heaven and earth. We know that. But listen to what the Cardinal says. All power is given to thee, that is of Mary, in heaven and on earth, so that at the command of Mary, oh, at the command of Mary, all day, even God, that's right, I'm reading what he wrote, even God obeys what Mary says. Blasphemy. That's right. Blasphemy. And yet, how many Baptists out there really know about this? How many Baptists, oh well, everybody has a right to their own beliefs. Everybody, just everybody to go, to go your way. You're, you're. I had a church in Kansas. I was trying to promote a certain missionaries. And I had a man, a Baptist member, who said this. Oh, I had to face it. I had to meet it. He says, we should not be sending missionaries to the foreign fields because they have their own religion. This is a man who was a member of the Baptist church that I pastored in Kansas. Pastor, what are you going to do when that happens? Do you like I did? <laughs> Stand up and say nope. No. We're going to send a missionary. That's right. We're going to send a missionary. Praise God. 
Can you imagine a Baptist saying that? He was supposed to have been one of the important members of the church. Wow, they've got their own religion. We don't need to send missionaries over there. One religion is as good as another. Oh, you hear that so often. Oh, man. Oh, oh read it again. Even God obeys Mary, and thus God has placed the whole church under the domination of Mary. Goes on to say, Mary is also the advocate of the whole human race, for she can do what she wills with God. Did you get that? I'm talking about a writing of the Cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. Another one. Mary is given the glory that belongs to Christ alone. Quote, the whole trinity, O oh Mary, he puts her, her name in capital letters. O oh Mary gave thee the trinity, the trinity gave thee a name above every other name. That at the name, at thy name, every knee should bow of things in heaven and on earth. And now listen to this part. And under the earth. And under the earth. Devils and all. Demons and all. All will bow to Mary. Well, I don't know about you. But all of this is abomination. Now go back to Revelation 17 again. And I'm going to cut it short here in just a little bit. I'm getting very tired. But um, how am I? I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> read it again. I won't read all of it. Pick, pick up in verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman. And who is that woman? Babylonianism. Samarimus, wife of Nimrod. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy. Have we not already seen that? Blasphemy. Pope Francis, by allowing the LGBT persuasion to take part in the doctrines and uh, traditions of the Roman Catholic Church is inviting the blasphemy of Babylonianism to enter in and take over. Well, verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. By the way, Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, probably one of the richest institutions in the world. I've got that in another, uh, I have a book that was written by a former Catholic priest. He exposes all of that. Rome is wealthy. Probably one of the most wealthy institutions on the face of the earth. They've got gold. They've got silver. They've got, they've got it. I don't know. I hope that book is unpacked. I'll see if I've still got it. And I'll read from that. I've still got books that are not unpacked yet. So these days, Lord willing, we're going to get them unpacked. Well, look at it again. Decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. But what is that golden? It's full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Mystery. Babylon the Great. The mother. Here it is. Here's that mother again. Samaritan is that great mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Verse 6, and here's the story of Baptist history. I'm going to have to quit. I'm, I'm, I'm overdoing it. I'm really, <laughs> I'm sorry. If someone wants to come up and conduct a few questions and answers, I'll let them do it. I'm going to have to sit down. But listen to this. Verse 6, 
And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. You know, people are prone to do that. Now, I don't know about you, but we're going to come back to Pergamos, Revelation chapter 2, and we'll get into some of the things that are there. But I've got to sit down. I didn't bring a drink with me, and I should have. I get too excited. <laughs> now, my old body is not what it used to be, Bill. But I read and read. I can't tell you. Now, I did not have a good morning, but I still read as much as I could. And then I finally had to lay down. Poor Liz had to come down and wake me up. I get tired. Jack, it's bad now. Wait till you get to be 90. But people, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. Amen. I'm proud of our Baptist history. And that history is not being told today as it should be being told. How many churches do you know where pastors do probably a year-long study on Baptist history? How many do you know? Right. Baptist, not just church history. I had church history at Baptist Bible College. Sad to say, I did not have Baptist history. That disturbs me. Now, it's out there. It's out there. There are those Baptists who have got into Baptist history, and I'm one of them. I'm proud to be a Baptist. I'm proud to say I'm a Baptist. Well, the Baptists are not Protestants. The Baptists did not come out of the Protestant church, right. or out of the Catholic church, I should say. We have standards. We have doctrinal standards. We should have practical standards separating ourselves so that those who see us will understand, wait a minute, they're different. They're different. They dress different. They act different. They talk different. All right? I got about 10 to you. If anybody wants to add to what I'm saying, you're welcome to come. I'm going to sit down. Or you're ready to quit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're blessed, Lord, to have been in your house. We're thankful, Lord, for our history. Thankfully, Lord, how we thank thee for our heritage. For those who have gone on before us, who stood for the truth. And Lord, even those out there today, though they may be few, are still standing for the truth. Lord, bless us. Help us now. Lord, I pray that this congregation will grow will reach out to others. And Lord, others will be willing to learn and avail themselves to the teaching of this church. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.